Welcome, everyone. So uh, I'd like to get started right away by finding out just what the level in the room is. So uh, how many pe who has used Chainer before? OK, my hope is that by the end of it, all of you will feel comfortable saying that you have used Chainer. OK, well, who has used a different framework? Uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, or coded from, wow, a, a good number of people. OK. My hope for you is that by the end of this session that you will have an understanding perhaps of how all AI frameworks work and how they fit together, and also specifically how Chainer can make the job of programming an AI framework easier. So who has never used an AI framework or done AI coding before? Welcome. My hope for you is that out of today's session, you'll get uh, some hands-on experience in doing AI coding, see that it's maybe not as scary as you might have thought it was, and actually with the right framework, it can be quite easy. So for the structure of the session, uh, I do want this to be hands-on. I encourage all of you who have a, a computer with you that you can use to please use it to, as we go through. Uh, we won't have a two-hour session, so we won't have any official breaks, but we'll have pauses where I hope you'll try to work through some of the exercises and work with the code that we have. Please ask your questions. Uh, we have a number of people here, and if you have a question, someone else probably has the same question. So please uh, feel free to let me know if there's anything that doesn't seem quite right or you want to know how something works. So uh, with that done, then I'll start with uh, looking at the overview. So uh, this might be a picture you haven't seen before. This is just a general framework of how um, an AI framework works. So you see in the very middle, we have the, uh, the data set. This is where your data comes in. Then we have a, a model on the other side. This is the neural network model. This is what you're trying to fit to. And the data set then goes inside of an iterator, which is going to determine your batch sizes and is then going to feed the data. Don't worry, you don't have to understand all of this now. There's, there's no test on it. I just want to give you the big picture before we get into the details. And the, the model then is optimized by uh, some kind of an optimizer, stochastic gradient descent, or something else. And we'll talk about that in a little later. The two of them are put together by an updater, where the iterator then feeds information into the model, which is then optimized. And then we have extensions that add extra things to tell you how your model is doing, what the accuracy is, how the, how the learning is going. And all of this is put together into a training loop. So this is the high level picture, but to really understand it, I think you need to actually use it. So the next thing is I'd like uh, first for everyone to log on to the network here, wireless network. And if you, if you don't have a computer or if something doesn't work, by the way, don't worry. Uh, everything that I talk about, I'll also have on the slides so you'll be able to follow along as well. But if you have a computer and you're interested, I encourage you to log on to the network here, uh, BCEC wireless network. Uh, do log on to a Google account. Uh, it's something that uh, we'll be using Google Colabs, Collaboratory for this, which provides free computing processing power. Um, and if you don't have an account, you can just make a, a disposable one on Gmail or something. And then uh, open the URL that, we've, that I've created for this session, which is bit.ly chainer-workshop. And this will open, actually, the uh, Jupyter Notebook-like uh, application, where you can then see all of the code as we're going through it. And it should give you a message that says, Open With. And if you click on the Open With, it'll say, Connect More Apps. And underneath that, it will see the icon for Collaboratory. And once that's done, you go to a File, Make a Copy, and then you'll have your own copy of it, because the copy you'll be seeing here is my copy. And if you change it, you would change what everyone else is seeing, and that might not be helpful for everyone else. So then if you make a copy, it'll make a copy to your own Google Drive, and then you'll be able to edit it, change it, run it as we're talking through this. So uh, before I get too much farther, Please take a moment and let me know if anyone has any like issues as we're going through this, as it seems OK, if you see a screen that seems not covered by this.
that's the right one. So there should be uh, an open with. So I think you need to have a login to, there you go, that, open with, connect more apps. There you go. Is it save a copy? Save a copy and drive. Save a copy and drive. That'll work just as well. Ah, okay. So uh, were you able to open the co-laboratory? And then if you go to the, the top of the menu under file, and then there's a bunch of options there, and one of them is save a copy to drive. Okay, mostly good. Okay. And will, uh, will this copy be running locally in the cloud? In the cloud, yeah. There will be some downloads, but fortunately all those downloads are happening in the Google servers, so we don't have to worry about anything here. The flip side of it being in the cloud, by the way, is this is a, a disposable drive, and if you put data on it, it would disappear the next day. But for this two-hour session, it's fine. Okay. With that done, then I think uh, hope we'll jump in. So uh, as you look at the, uh, the co-laboratory notebook, uh, the first thing that you'll see is there's a, a line for installing CuPy, Chainer, and NumPy. So let me take a moment to, to tell you a, a little bit about Chainer. Um, uh, as they mentioned in the, the keynote this morning, it was created in Japan uh, by my company, Preferred Networks, and is now open source. And it's uh, very, very well known in Japan, but much less so outside of Japan. It's an AI framework that allows you to use Python. In fact, uh, it's nearly 100% Python. If you look at the Google GitHub, it says over 99% Python which means you have the ability very easily to look at all of the code and see what it's doing if you have a question about how the functions work. And as you're running it, it's running live, it's interpreted. So the error messages that come up are appropriate to the context. So you can, if you have an IDE, you can actually stop it there and you can see the value of all the variables as you work through it. So it's very easy to debug and see what's actually happening. The other benefit is it is the uh, back end for the calculation on the GPU. It uses CuPy, which is uh, another product made by Preferred Networks, which enables you to do calculation on the GPU using a NumPy format. So those of you who are familiar with Python will recognize NumPy. And basically, CuPy is intended as a drop-in replacement. So nearly all of the commands and very, uh, functions that you have available in NumPy are available in CuPy as well, except for they're calculated on the GPU. Okay, so uh, if you haven't done so yet, please run this first cell. It'll give you uh, a bunch of output of installing things and, and crunching through things. This is all happening at the Google servers. Um, but it'll take uh, two or three minutes or so for it to download, download Coupai and Coupai. To, to tell you what it's doing here, um, these are sort of special commands that needed to be done to run it in the, the Google Code Laboratory. It comes with some graphic drivers for the NVIDIA card, but not all of them, so it's missing libqsparse and libnvtrc. And, and don't ask me what those libraries actually do, by the way. That's <laughs> a little deeper than this discussion will go. And then linking them up so that you're able to access them. Then it installs CuPy for the calculation of the GPU. And then it installs Chainer, uh, which is the AI framework we'll be using today. We import Chainer as uh, actually I think CH, I think I might have updated this since I updated the slide, and importing NumPy as NP. So uh, that may still be going, but let's go ahead and jump to the next thing. Once it's actually installed, you should see, uh, when it prints the runtime, you should see something like this. Um, there's also a possibility that some of you will see that CuPy is not available. Um, what that means is that you've tried to install CuPy on a machine that doesn't have a GPU. Uh, sometimes when I've run these seminars, uh, we've used so many GPUs that Google says you can't have any more at that IP address because we think you're farming cryptocurrencies or something. 
and stops, deploy, stops uh, distributing GPUs. Uh, it doesn't matter, all of this will still run. Um, these are fairly small data sets, so we can run it on the CPU as well. So now we're down to the, uh, the first part of the, the diagram. We're gonna work with the data set. So the data set uh, is one of the most important parts as you've probably heard in deep learning. It makes a huge difference how much data you have available. So for this uh, exercise, we're gonna use uh, MNIST, but not the MNIST you've probably seen before. I think if you've gone to a few of these uh, seminars here, you've probably seen a whole bunch of little grayscale zeros, ones, twos, and threes. MNIST was created actually 20 years ago this year. Uh, it was a groundbreaking data set at the time, but it's now 20 years old and it's honestly too easy for many neural networks. So instead, we'll be going more fashionable, we'll be using Fashion MNIST, which was created actually last year. So it has, it's basically the same format as MNIST, it's got um, 60,000 examples, it's the same size, but all of them are pictures of clothing. T-shirts, bags, anklets, and other things. So it's a more interesting and more challenging data set, which will give you a better indication of how your neural network is doing. So let me go through what this, uh, what this line is doing. And while I'm talking again, go ahead and run this, please. Uh, the, because the first thing it'll need to do is it'll need to download the data set. And again, that'll take two or three minutes, actually. Um, so go ahead and run this as I talk through what this code is actually doing. So uh, first, uh, it, uh, we're downloading the data set. Uh, importing it, and then these are the actual labels for what's the 10 categories in the data set. It's a little bit, uh, it requires explanation more so than MNIST, which is zero through nine. Uh, it has t-shirts, tops, trousers, pullovers, dresses, coats, other things. And then we make uh, a training set and a test set. And this is, uh, comes default basically with fashion MNIST. And then we do something else that I think some of the other sessions that's Honestly, very important, but not often done. So when you're doing coding for an AI network, you should really have three data sets, not two. And the reason is, is because as you're training, first of all, you need to have one set to the training on. And then the model will learn that data set. But if you're not careful, it will actually just memorize that data set. And it won't be generalizable. It won't be able to tell you about any different data that's not in your original data set. So you should hold out some data in a test set that then will tell you whether you really have learned the solution, whether you've just memorized all of the examples that you specifically had. But if you have the test set and you keep on changing your model and changing other things, then trying to get a better answer on the test set, indirectly, your model will start learning the test set as well. So you should have three sets. One set is the test, is the training set. And this is the majority of our examples. It's about 50,000 examples we'll have in the training set. You should have a test set, which is your final check. When you're seeing, have I really learned this information? And then you should have a third set, which is the validation set. And this is what you should use just to check your training as you're going through. So the test set is left off to the very side. We won't talk about it again until as we're getting towards the end of, the co end of this uh, session. But the validation set is what we'll use to see how we're doing as we're going through. Basically every epoch we'll check, okay, we've trained on this data, how are we against this data that it hasn't been trained on? To make sure that our model is generalizable. So the next two lines are basically matplotlib, which enables us to do pictures like this. It's an external library. Um, and then these next lines here are basically just to give you an idea of your data set. So I think it's really important as you, you go through these, as you see what the shape of the data is, how it's stored so that you understand it, so that when you're putting in a different data set, you know how it should look. So these next couple of lines are just to give us some examples. We take the very first instance out of the training data set, uh, which is a t-shirt top, and then we print the shape of train, uh, which is 50,000 lines, and each uh, line has two entries in it. And then we get the shape of those two entries, which is X, which is to see X shape, which shows you that X is uh, 784 lines long. And the, the number 784 is basically 28 times 28. Each of these is a little 28 by 28 um, grid. And then a grid of what, so then the next line actually tells you, gives some raw data out of X, which as you can see is just basically numbers between zero and one. So it's, it's already been normalized for you. So it's uh, low values, and you can see that. 
And then we have actually the picture here and what the label is for the first picture. So uh, I'd like to go to the, uh, the first hands-on. Uh, play with the data. You have, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Python, or at least if you have some familiar with code, take a look at it. Uh, pick a, number, a different picture out of the data set. So I picked uh, the very first picture out of the data set. Uh, who knows how you would pick a different picture from the data set? Right. Right, change the, uh, change the zero to a different number. So if you change this to a, a different number, you'll see a different picture. So you can see another article of clothing. Okay, uh, take different samples of raw X. Uh, just get yourself familiar with touching the code and, and making some changes in it. Maybe print out some different shapes or something. See what it looks like. How do you split the cell? How do you split the cell? Uh, at the top of it, there's a line where it has cell plus. And if you click on cell plus, you can get another cell beneath it, then you can put whatever you want into that cell. You see where that is? Yeah, code, yeah, right. Sure. Is that working for everyone? Oh, still running? Oh, is it still doing some of the downloading before? Okay. Good, this is a good point to catch up before we get too much farther into it. Okay. So uh, feel free to, to continue to, to play with the data. This is intended to give you a chance to take a look at it as we're doing this. Um, and I'll continue on it. I have, uh, I'll put other things in here, by the way, like flipping the image upside down or right to left that are more challenging that you can't do with what I've told you here so far. Um, as I said, this is, uh, you won't be tested on these things. So you can feel free to use the internet uh, and search for other things. Uh, in particular, the Chainer docs will be helpful for some of this, although we'll have some slides on here later. So the next uh, stage is now that we have the data set, now we want to put that inside of an iterator. So the iterator basically is going to take uh, portions of the data and then put it into batches so that it can be processed. So inside of the iterator, we're going to uh, choose a batch size to be processed, to be trained on. So the batch size is basically taking a certain number of samples out of the training set that it will then send over to the model to be the updater to train on. So in this time, I've uh, chosen a batch size of 128. Um, the maximum size that you could make for this is 50,000, because that's how many examples we have within the test set. And if you did that, it wouldn't learn very much, because it would only update the model one time. It would take 50,000 examples and then have one slight change to the, the model and wouldn't learn much. The flip side is if you made the batch size extremely small, if you made it closer to one, it'll have many, many steps, but the processing will be slow. It's not, it's not batched up very fast. And also it, it might be more erratic in its travels because by doing 128 at a time, it gets a better representation of more of an average of which way it needs to move to improve the model. So we then put that into uh, the serial iterator. Um, there are a couple other kinds of iterators, but the serial iterator is most commonly used. Uh, there's multi-threaded or, multi or GPU processing that can be done. And we make three iterators, one for the training, uh, one for the validation, and then one for the uh, test iteration. And uh, we don't want it to repeat data and in the order that it's came in, because the order in, in Fashion MNIST is already pretty much random, so that's fine. Okay, so let's get to the model, and this is kind of the heart of, uh, of machine learning. 
So the model is basically saying what we want, uh, what we think the data should look like. And in machine learning, it's going to be very general. You might have seen models like this before. So this is uh, based off of neurons. So basically, each of these, uh, the input layer here, in this case, is going to be 784 lines long. Because it's basically each one of those pixels is going to feed into the model. And then we'll have three layers that are hidden layers between that. And this is where it's learning how to activate and try to figure out what the data is like. And then we have the output layer, which in this case will be 10 long. Anyone know why it's going to be 10, 10 nodes on the output layer? 10 different pieces of clothing, yes. <laughs> exactly. Right, so since we have 10 different kinds of clothing, each output, each output layer, each output node will be for one different kind of clothing. Okay? So um, this is something actually uh, we just released in Chainer in the last uh, two weeks ago when we released Chainer version 4. So we've made it even easier to make neural network models. We released a new kind of uh, structure called uh, sequential. Um, those of you who've used Keras before, I think it's kind of similar to the Keras model, but I, I think a little easier to use, but I'm biased on that, so. Um, and uh, this is some of the ways you can use it. You can make a, a linear model, which basically is saying that you have 10 nodes here, 10 nodes in, 10 nodes out, and you're using ReLU, which is an activation function. So I, I won't go too much into the uh, different kinds of activation functions. ReLU is usually the most common, I think, to be used, to be used today for most models. Uh, it's a rectified linear unit, which basically means if the value is below zero, it's zero. But if it's greater than zero, it's going to be a straight feed linear upward, linearly upwards. And these sequential models can be done fairly, uh, can be repeated. So you can do multiple layers of the same kind of thing. Um, they can be added together. So you can take uh, one sequential model of, two linear, of a linear line and add it to another one. So it's very easy to uh, manipulate and set up this way. But uh, I think it's easier to look at an actual example of it. So here's our very first neural network model. So let me go through what it's doing. So the first thing that we have is we're importing chainer functions as f. And chainer functions are just what you think of them. They're basically simple mathematical functions. Uh, the ReLU is uh, one of the functions. Um, there's also a leaky ReLU, um, sigmoid functions, tan h functions, activation functions. These don't have any parameters in them that are learnable. So these are part of just how the, the neurons are going to link together. But the second thing that we're going to import is the links, which is the chainer links. And these are where our, the learnable parameters in our model are held. So those are you familiar with neural networks. These are where the weights and biases are, are put inside of the model, or within the links. And chainer is called chainer because we link all of these functions and links together to make our neural model. So in this particular model, we have a base layer, which is a, a linear layer with 100 nodes in it, followed by a, relo, uh, a relu function, activation function. And then we repeat this twice. And then at the end of it, we have our linear layer with 10 nodes in it. And this is for the, uh, the output for each piece of uh, clothing. And then we return the model. So now once we have our multi-layer perceptron model defined, we call an instance of it. So now we have our model. And then to check on it, we do a print out of it. We flatten it out so that the repeated layers just doesn't say repeat. It shows what it's actually repeated. And then give a flattened model of it. And this is what you see in the output here. So we can see that we have our linear layer, which has 100 nodes, another a relu, another linear layer with 100 nodes, another relu, and then 10 nodes. So the next thing we have is the GPU ID of uh, zero. And uh, I think that probably if you want to use the, uh, the CPU, it'll be negative one. And I think on the code, it might be negative one just so that we don't have the issues with Google running out of GPUs. And then uh, if it, we're using the GPU, in other words, if it's zero or greater, then we move the, uh, the model to the GPU so that the calculation can be done there locally on the GPU. So I think this might be quite new. Uh, who has questions about the model or how it's put together? Go ahead. So the, you said the input layer is on the order of 700, right? Matching the 784, correct. Right? So what is the number 100? What is that? How does that, what's its relationship with the input layer? 
it's arbitrary. So this is part of trying to figure out what kind of a model. Um, seems like a good number, and uh, in a minute I'll invite you to change that in something and see if you can find a better number. But uh, it could, in some models, they'll do ten, they could 32 here. I've seen 32 used for MNIST, fashion MNIST as well, or 1,000 I've seen as well. Uh, 100, another reason for choosing 100 instead of 1,000 is that we want the model to run reasonably quickly for most of you. Um, it'll obviously take longer to run if you have more nodes inside of it. But it's something that there's no specific exact answer for that. It's, it's something how many nodes you want to put in there. It's, it's one of the tuning factors. Yes? Correct. So the, the last layer is the output. Yes, correct. So the, the question was, uh, for the last layer, there's no activation function or sigmoid function here. So what this means is basically the, uh, the last layer then will be a vector of 10 digits, and it could have any value from negative to positive. And we'll basically take the highest value out of this as the most likely to be the answer. And that'll be, as we step a few more later, you'll see where we actually do that. Yes? Uh, I th so the, I would say that each layer can be a model. We could make a, a layer, we could make a model literally with just one layer. Um, it wouldn't be a very smart one. <laughs> right, but I guess what I'm asking is the first two lines in that function are layer and model. Mm -hmm. Different kinds of things? So these are local to the function. These are just made here. I, I made this layer just to say that then when we make the model, it's two layers repeated. Right. So, um, the layer is uh, one example of this. I could have also just made the model into the layer and skipped this middle line, and it still would have been valid. OK. Yes? Yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, so um, uh, I'm afraid we won't get the chance to do all of the topologies available to us. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I'll, I'll get into actually another structure for doing this in, in a minute. Um, this is meant to be a, a straightforward example. But uh, Chainer is capable of doing, uh, because it's all Python, you have the ability to do basically unlimited customization. So Chainer supports CNNs, RNNs, reinforcement learning, uh, basically everything that's available. Yes? Uh, that one's also arbitrary. So it's, it's uh, in general, uh, this is the age of deep learning, and so more layers is generally considered to be better. Um, and you'll need to do other things as you get more layers, like add in more regularization, um, add things to make sure that the signal that goes through all the layers is still strong enough. But um, two was chosen here as a simple one that will run fairly quickly, and uh, more would probably be better. Yes? I'm you didn't, uh, two sets of weights. No. Uh, so the weights are, autom um, as creating the model, the weights are automatically randomized. Um, and uh, there is functionality within Chainer to, to set them to a particular kind of uh, random uh, Gaussian randomization or other things. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, how did we get the value for the, uh, the initial settings for all the parameters? Um, neural networks are, uh, because there's many paths through it, if you start with all of the values at zero, then you don't get an interesting neural network because all the paths are the same. So you, they start with a random seed value, and that's already set up for you, so I haven't put anything here about it. That's automatic. And you can change it if you think that there's a better random distribution you'd like to use to seed these with. So uh, then we, uh, we printed this out. Uh, then the next thing we need to do is we need to take a look at the model loss. So the model loss is basically the way that we grade how our neural network is doing. 
So as you're going through the neural network and the training examples, each time you do that, you want to have an idea of how close you were to the correct answer. Did you have uh, the perfect answer? Which, if you get it right, in which case the loss would be zero. If you had only one, you said this is a t-shirt with 100% accuracy and you said everything else was zero, that would be zero loss. But most of the time, the neural network will be trying to make a guess and it will be off by a certain amount. And this is what we need to use to train the model with. So here we put in an, a classifier. And uh, for those of you who are more familiar with kinds of classifiers, it's using softmax cross entropy to do this. Um, and then this, uh, basically then, we put our model inside of the L classifier, and then this model loss will be used to do the training with. And then uh, again with the uh, GPU, let's see, we've, I think I already talked about that, did I? What's a different slide? Uh, sorry, yeah, with the GPU we put it to the, uh, the model, uh, we put the model loss to the GPU as well so that we can use it on the, on the GPU. Okay. Okay. So uh, I wanted to show you another way that you can define this. Uh, before, two weeks ago, this was the standard way that was done in Chainer. Um, so this is a more classic kind of thing. Those of you who are familiar with PyTorch, um, this might look kind of familiar. It's a fairly similar style. So this is uh, defining a, a neural network model. And in this model, basically you initialize the layers. And this again has uh, three layers. And then you initialize that when it's called, then it does the functions between them. So in this one we have uh, layer one has uh, n mid units, which is again 100 here. Layer two has another 100 units. And then layer three has 10 units out. And then again, the function between this is a ReLU. So the benefits of this uh, kind of structure is that it gives you more access to it. You can put error messages within the actual code of the, uh, the model itself. And it enables you to stop execution within the model. And also, this can enable you to do more complex models. Uh, the sequential is so-called because it, it handles sequential models. But some of the newer models nowadays have skip layers. Um, the more recent CNNs will jump between layers, or they'll have forks or merges of the data as it goes through, which the sequential is not able to handle. So for that, you would need to use this kind of thing, uh, this kind of a model. And this is a, a screenshot, by the way, of the Chainer docs. Uh, I haven't mentioned it before, but the URL that we're using here, I'll, I'll put down here in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, but probably if you just search for sequential and uh, chainer, it'll come up, or chainer models, it'll come up as well. So uh, let's talk about the optimizer. So the model itself uh, doesn't teach itself. So we need to give it another function that will teach it how to change its weights and variable, its, par its parameters to improve the guess for next time. So every time we go through a batch of 128 examples, we then need to do some back propagation and figure out exactly how we should change the value so that we can make a better guess next time. And that's what the optimizer is. So the most common optimizer that you've heard of probably is stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it's the original one that came out. It's basically using a straight derivative a gradient to go back through to calculate through what that's about. And um, uh, I think that it's, uh, I think it's better to cover, uh, use Adam instead, which is what I've chosen to use in an optimizer here. Stochastic gradient descent is a classic uh, type of optimizer, but Adam, which uh, stands for adaptive momentum, and is also based off of gradient descent, but it has some other uh, momentum-like characteristics in it, so it's a little better at giving you an estimate for that. And then we put up our model loss inside of this. We set that up inside of the optimizer so that then uh, it can use that Adam will then optimize our model for us. OK, the next thing we'll, I'll talk about is the updater. And uh, once we have the model, you'll notice that some of these get quite a bit simpler with just one line. So the updater basically then uh, takes both our iterator and our optimizer. And again, we need to tell it where the data is and the models are. And then this is the updater that will then take the batches from the tr iterator, put it into the optimizer that then will improve our model. So the next part is the extensions. And extensions are a part of the training process that basically give us more information about what's happening. So uh, this can give us a, a graph of what our model looks like. It can show us how well our accuracy is going, how our loss is going, what's happening as it's actually doing the training. 
So here we're doing the, uh, the trainer. And inside of the trainer now, we have our updater. Uh, we have some settings here, which is uh, we're going to do this training for 30 epochs. Uh, this epics here is because you could also set this to a certain number of iterations or a certain number of batches if you wanted to as well. But typically you would use epics. Uh, we want to put the output into a folder called result and then the extensions. So uh, we use a bunch of extensions here so that as it's doing the training we can see what's happening and get more information about what's going on. So the first one is the evaluator. I mentioned before that you need to have a a set that's different and separate from your training set. And that's the validation set. So we use the validation iterator to give information to the evaluator to tell us how we're doing against out of, out of training set data. And this will give us our scoreboard that really matters that tells us how do we do against something that we haven't seen before. Then we have uh, dump a graph so that you can see what your, your neural network graph looks like. And we have to log the activities. So each epoch then it will say what's your accuracy, what's the loss, what's the validation accuracy, and what's the validation loss. And then we'll get a plot of that so that we can see how the progress is going. And then each epoch will also print out a report so that we can see it as it's going, how many seconds it's taken and, and what's the score so far. So I, these are easier if you actually take a look at them. So uh, if you go ahead and run this, uh, the trainer, this is training your network. So it will start training, running through the, train, the network. And then it will show you the, uh, the epics. This will be a little slower than this. You can see it's taking about, mm, about eight seconds or so for each epic with this model. And then you have your, uh, your main loss and the validation loss, your accuracy on the training data, which is the main accuracy, and then you have your uh, validation accuracy as well. And uh, as you can see here, actually, no, I'll look at that in a second. So basically, this is the printout that you'll see as you're going through it. You can get a feeling for how you're going through, how many uh, epochs you've gone through. The graph that we printed out is this graph, and it'll be a little bit hard to see. It's a little large for the page. This tells you all of the actual math, and this can be used to make sure that the, the uh, the graph or the neural network that you've designed is as you want it to be. So we start out with um, the uh, data, which is this uh, line right here, which is 784 lines by 128, which is our batch size. And then we have weights and biases. So these are the, un the parameters then that are used to learn. And each time it goes through, it updates these weights and biases. This goes into linear function, which then goes into the ReLU that we had which is then put into another linear function. And again, now the size is 100 nodes and 128 for the batch size. And then the weights and biases that goes through another linear function down to a ReLU. And then we have uh, the last uh, linear function, which is again 100 nodes. And then that goes down into the, the 10 nodes, which goes into the softmax cross entropy that I talked about, which is the classifier, which tells you how it fits together to give you your final float your loss score. Okay, any questions about the graph? Okay. So this is then telling us how we did. So this is the, the loss which is telling you how far off the answers were that it had. And you can see that uh, basically the training data is getting better all the time, but the validation data got better and then it kind of trailed off here. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, machine learning, what is this doing here? Overfitting, right. So basically it's, it's memorizing the data that we gave it, but against examples that it hasn't seen before, it's starting to lose the plot, <laughs> right? It doesn't really quite know, it, it, it doesn't do as well on those as it did on the ones that it's, we've seen before. And we can see that again when we look at the accuracy. So for the accuracy, we started out, uh, for the, the training data, we started out about 80% accuracy and are continuing to go up to about 95% accuracy. But for the validation set, we started at about 84% and now we're kind of at about 88% or so and not gaining as quickly. So uh, now it's your, up to you to improve the model. So I mentioned that some of those figures are arbitrary. You have code in front of you. I recommend, uh, recommend that you try and change some things, see what you can do better. Uh, change the number of epochs, 
have it trained for a longer time, see if it gets better over time, uh, change the batch size, see how that affects the performance of it, uh, the number, change the number of nodes or layers, both of those can be tuned, um, change from Atom to a different optimizer, uh, capital S, capital G, capital D would give you stochastic gradient descent. Uh, you can look up the documents. There's a number of popular ones, Momentum, RMS Prop, other optimizers. Um, uh, you also can pass arguments into the optimizer. So there's a learning rate in there that's an argument that can be done. Um, change the, uh, the, w the decay of the, uh, the optimization. Change from ReLU to a different activation function like leaky ReLU or something else. Or add regularization, which would be adding dropout or batch normalization. So uh, please give that a try. Please change something and uh, ask me any questions if it doesn't go quite right or if you'd like to know something about it. Relationship with the number of connections. Um, other than that, that you're dropping at a certain percentage of them, not really. I mean, I'm, I think that uh, dropout is something, especially as you get to, to deeper layers, it becomes more important that you keep it from memorizing the data samples. Deeper layers or, or more nodes within the layer corresponds to a more powerful model, which is going to give it more ability to memorize the data straight. So then you need to have a uh, dropout to keep it from doing that. Okay? Uh -huh. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, more nodes is generally going to help you. That's true. So it, it you'll, yes. Yes. It's slower to run. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, what I think uh, accuracy people are seeing is probably around 88%. Um, by the way, uh, the human accuracy on this data set is 83.5%. Uh, <laughs> so if you, it's already at superhuman levels at 88%. Yep. You can use multiple process. Uh, you can see that uh, you have the opportunity to, to move things to the GPU and otherwise. Uh, for example, you could put the, um, the iterator, the validation could be tested on the CPU. So you do have the ability to put data in different places. Or running multiple threads would also be another way to do that. One, two, three, four, yep. If you have multiple GPUs, yes. Yes. So, yeah. Um, Chainer is very good at using multiple GPUs. In fact, uh, Chainer is very strong at using multiple nodes. So using multiple servers is one of the strengths. It's uh, one of the fastest frameworks for using that. Um, there's uh, competitions for who can run through ImageNet in the fastest time. And uh, the record, uh, I think, as of around this time last year was held by Facebook, which did, ran ImageNet. I think they talked about it in today's morning session. Uh, it has something like uh, 15 million or some images. And it was done by Facebook in 60 minutes. And uh, my company, Preferred Networks, using 1,024 GPUs, did it in 15 minutes, um, which uh, was quite a challenge and very proud. So it uh, scales very well. Let me see if my GPU is uh, back online now. There we go. Okay. Other questions? The challenges, or the, oh, the code. There we go. This? Okay, sure. 
So partial, what partial is doing is this allows you to do a partial function. So uh, another way that you could do this um, without using partial actually is if you use the default dropout value of 50%, then you could just append f dropout and you wouldn't need to use the partial function. So it, it's, uh, it's allowing you to pass a function without defining all the values of the function. Uh, and you might have to use this for other things as well, um, such as uh, max dropout. Um, drop out or uh, max pool would also require you to use a partial function so that you can pass it in the sequential model. If you use the other style of, uh, of model definition, uh, then the partial is not required. This can, you can pass all the arguments into it from this. Okay? Okay, uh, I think I'll continue on to the, uh, the other parts of it. Uh, it's fun to do the training and work with that, and uh, there are still other things that need to be done. So uh, I mentioned the uh, test evaluator before, and that we should set aside another data set that we don't try, that we don't use until the very end. If you were uh, benchmarking in this or something, you're doing a competition, you wouldn't even have access to this data set. It would be held by the evaluators who then would find out how your, how your model is working. And I wanted to include it here so that you know that once you think you've, once you've done all your tuning, you found the right number of layers, you found the right number of nodes, you have the right um, normalizers and regularizers, this is how you test your overall accuracy with the uh, test set. So we use our test iterator, uh, we use the evaluator and the model loss again, and then this gives you actually your text accuracy with this third data set, which we don't touch until the very last. Of course, if it comes up badly, then maybe you have to touch it again, but the point is, is to use this less than any other data set so that you don't learn it inadvertently. Okay? So um, the other part of, the next part of it is dealing with some of the other steps besides just training. Uh, in my company, we're uh, a bunch of researchers, so we oftentimes forget that it's not enough just to have trained the model, you need to be able to implement and apply it. So in order to save the model, so we've gone through, we've run this, and we've learned all the weights and biases. In order to save the model, uh, we have a format uh, uh, tool that we call serializers, which saves it in NPZ format. This is uh, standing for a NumPy, NumPy format, actually. And you can save it as my MNIST model or whatever. This is just a made up name. And then we just do a check to make sure that the, the model actually exists. So now we have our trained model and we've saved it. So let's see how we would bring it back is we make our inference model. So now that we've done the training, we have a specific example that we want to find out which article of clothing it is in this particular case. So this time, instead of using the serializer to save the data, we're going to load it from the MPZ format into the inference model. Again, we'll move this to the GPU as, as appropriate. And uh, we get a test image and label it. Um, so this is then basically showing you what the test image is and what the ground truth is. In other words, what's the correct answer for what this is? And so now we need to actually do the inference on it. So we uh, basically make a mini batch size of one. Since we're doing an inference, we have one particular example we want to label. Uh, put it into the right shape, move it to the GPU as necessary. And do the, uh, let's see, we want to do the forward calculation of the model basically by giving it in the, uh, by telling it that we're not training it this time. We're gonna actually use the inference model for X to find out what we think it is. And the answer is included in Y data, and then we're gonna take the arg max of that. So we have some, uh, we're gonna print the labels, of what it looks like, so that we can see uh, basically what the size of it is and what the predicted label is. And the predicted label in this case was an ankle boot, but it will depend on the actual framework and what your model looks like to see whether it came up with the right answer or not. Okay, any questions about loading and saving models? What? Yes. Sure. Yeah, it's standard stuff. I don't think there was any, I just uh, don't, don't think there's any particular choice for that. OK. 
Okay? So let's see then. So uh, I'd like to take a look at uh, some of the other things that we have available in Chainer. So some of the other things that you'll do when we're using data is that you want to take a look and is you might want to take a look and see how you could augment the data. So when we talked earlier on, we talked about how it's really important to have as much data as possible. So one of the other things that oftentimes you'll want to do is you want to take the data that you have and change it slightly so that you can continue to learn more from the same data. So inside of Chainer, we have uh, a number of extensions to Chainer. One of them is uh, Chainer CV for computer vision. And that includes a number of transforms that you can use to transform the data. So this is uh, quite a bit of new code here. I, I didn't want you to have to type all of this in uh, during the session here. So uh, if you look at this uh, URL down here of bit.lycw-augment, it will give you a, uh, another Jupyter notebook that basically has this data already in it. So that you can then do a copy-paste as, as you will. So to talk about what this is doing, uh, basically we're going to do, um, we're going to go through and we're going to get the, the mean of the data and then the, the standard deviation of the data using the NumPy functions. And then we'll use that to do a, a standardization for the images just to normalize it. This data is pretty normalized, but this is a good idea to do this in general. And then we use some of the uh, transforms from Chainer CV to do some flipping of the images and expansions of the images. So when, when using with computer vision, it's oftentimes useful to expand the image so that you're getting a close-up of it in some ways so that you can take a different look at it. And this will then uh, transform the data so that we have more data inside of it. And then we make ourselves uh, transform data sets. And these transformed data sets are actually transformed each epoch. So every time that it's doing a new epoch, it will come in and look at a different data set. Okay? And then we make iterators that then are based off of the transformed data sets. So this enhances our training by giving slightly different pictures each time, by giving a bit of a zoom in or giving a transform of it so it's learning from a different image. So the, uh, this uh, notebook runs by itself where you can take this uh, information and then find it and then copy paste it into the existing notebook if you've made changes that you like there. So are people familiar with, uh, with transformations and have worked with this kind of thing before with other languages? Yeah? Yes. Right. So it, and it's doing it's doing these transformations then within each epoch. So it's hands off for your part of view. It's not a one time transform, and that way with each epoch actually it's getting a different um, different picture for different transform. So we, we've taken this pretty much so far at uh, very much of a, a direct approach of just using fully connected linear layers. So we probably won't have too much time to go over this, but I wanted to also take a look at CNNs, which is convolutional neural networks. So uh, a convolutional neural network is a different approach than just the fully connected neural layers. So in a convolutional neural network, what we do is we, uh, we make a, what they call a convolution using a kernel. So this is a small uh, field, a filter, if you will. And this can be compared to like an Instagram filter or something, where you're basically looking for lines or something, where you're getting a bas relief or a change in it. And these are all neural networks. These are all parameters that are learned about how to do this. You can see that each of these has actually slightly different ones. And the convolution and the kernel is passed over the entire picture. So uh, there's more that you can read about this. This, di this diagram here is actually from uh, 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 an explanation of it uh, on convolutional neural networks. And uh, it has, there's more to learning about convolutional neural networks than we'll be able to explain in this session. But I wanted to take a look at how it can be used within Chainer. 
So this is the, uh, the LayNet 5, um, was made by Yan Le Yancy Lacoon. And this was the uh, first uh, convolutional neural network that was used that, uh, basic, that revolutionized vision. And it has a, a number of convolutions and sampling and convolutions and subsamplings. And this has uh, basically a picture of an A that goes through several convolutions and then subsamples it down to a smaller size, then does a convolution, subsamples it down to a smaller size, and then has fully connected layers before coming to a 10-digit output. So the picture is a little bit tricky to understand. I think it's actually more clear in some ways to look at the actual model. And again, this is using the more detailed, uh, more hands-on form of model as opposed to the sequential model. So you can see the layers here is that we, the first layer is a convolution, a two-dimensional convolution with uh, the one channel in, which is going to be the grayscale, and it's going out into six channels. So it's making, taking basically six different filters passing over this to give us more data about what the picture looks like. And then the size of each of these kernels is five as it's going through. So in the, the picture before it had a size of three by three. The size in this one is uh, five by five. And then this continues through and the next one takes six channels in. So this out channels here are six channels in and continues to find more detail going to 16 channels. And then we have another convolution that takes those 16 channels and goes out to 120 channels. And then we have two linear layers. And this goes from the 120 channels to 84. And then from the 84 channels to 10 channels to get ready for our output. And the connections between these is we're using sigmoids. And then we're doing the max pooling, which is reducing the size by two. Another sigmoid, another max pooling, sigmoid, sigmoid. And then uh, this will then return the soft max, depending on whether we're actually in a training situation or not, or it'll return the value. So this, uh, this again, is, uh, this is from the documentation on Chainer. And uh, to save you the trouble of actually entering this in, uh, we have another notebook. CWS LNET-5 that then provides this code which is basically put into the chainer code and is executable. So this will give you a, a stronger view of how to see the data and this will actually make the, uh, the LayNet 5 so that you can run the data on it. And this will take a longer time to run because it's a more complex model with more parameters to be learned. So one of the other uh, small changes that need to be made up here is that uh, for the M, fashion MNIST data, we need to change the dimensions from one to three so that we have uh, three different, different dimensions since LANET 5 is made basically for interpreting color data and so it's expecting to see RGB as opposed to just grayscale. So this is something else that you can uh, try and see how it goes. I think we're getting towards lunch time or uh, towards coffee break time. Um, so I'd like to uh, talk about uh, other things that you can do from here. So uh, thank you very much for listening to these things about Chainer. So uh, from here you can do things like uh, installing in your Chainer on your own PC for local work if you have a GPU that's an NVIDIA GPU or doing it on the CPU itself. Uh, cloud resources, as we saw today, uh, you've probably seen some of the other sessions as well. It's uh, much easier than it used to be to get cloud instances or GPUs, either using Google Colabs or using uh, Kaggle notebooks or other places to do work with uh, uh, neural networks. And many of them come with GPUs now as well. Uh, the models are available also in the Chainer doc pages. So if you search for Chainer and go to uh, docs.chainer.org, you can see that we have many models there. We have a, a list of uh, model examples that use the more uh, complicated ones. The LayNet 5 is there as well as the VGG and some other ones. And then also we use Chainer in our office for everything. So we have a number of extensions to Chainer. We've taken a look already at Chainer CV, which is used for doing augmentation of uh, computer vision and has more computer models and allows for trained models that you can use and leverage. Uh, we have a Chainer RL for reinforcement learning, which gives plugins for doing faster reinforcement learning for playing video games and other things. And then we have Chainer MN, which is, stands for multi-node. So this is specialized in doing computing on multi-nodes. And uh, this has been a big initiative for us with Chainer this year, 
uh, because with all of the clouds coming up with automated learning things, we think it's going to be very important to be able to leverage the code that you write over multiple GPUs on multiple computers. So you basically will pay for the same number of compute time, but get it much more quickly by having multiple computers working in parallel. And uh, in the benchmarks that we've done, Chainer has come out at the top of this, and uh, we hope that we can show this advantage both on Amazon Workplace, uh, Amazon Web Services, and also on Azure as well. And then uh, uh, Seamus mentioned this morning, but uh, and for all the open source projects, of course, we're hoping for feedback on this. If you have issues or other things you find, please let us know so that we can fix them. And if you're uh, comfortable with coding, putting in pull requests as well, uh, we've shifted to spending a lot of our time reviewing proposed changes and fixing things as opposed to driving all the changes ourselves. So you have uh, support is available on, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the docs at uh, docschainer.org. Um, also, we have an active stack overflow um, for Chainer. And we have uh, a Slack channel as well. If you want immediate feedback or you're interested in chatting about it, we also are very active there, too. So uh, to review, I think in today's session, hopefully you've uh, had a chance to play around with Chainer and actually get a feeling for what it looks like and see how a model can be put together. Uh, this has obviously not taught you everything there is to know yet about uh, neural networks and other things, but I hope it's given you an idea of how Chainer can be an easy way into this uh, to get access to how to do this. So I thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope you'll continue to take a look at using Chainer in your uh, activities. So thank you very much.